Hello and uh, welcome to Granada Reports. Hello there, good to have your company this evening on the programme tonight. A devoted nurse for more than 30 years, but when Pat needed emergency care at her local hospital, staff read the wrong medical note which told them, do not resuscitate. It is beyond belief quite how catastrophically she was failed, not by one individual, but by the NHS Trust. In memory of Caitlin, the mum determined to cut the number of young drivers killed on our roads. Missing, the desperate plea for information about 15-year-old Ben, last seen in Liverpool. We'll be live with the latest. We are going up another promotion for Stockport County. All the reaction as their remarkable football comeback continues. That's in the sport with Mike. And the Blossom has taken a battering here in the northwest today with strong winds. Better news ahead weather-wise. The details are coming up later. So please do stay with us. But first tonight, she was a devoted grandma who gave more than 30 years service to the NHS as a nurse. But when 73-year-old Pat Dawson was taken to hospital in Blackburn, there was a serious mistake in her care. In the confusion of a busy ward, the medical team treating her had been given the wrong person's notes. Well, that person's medical file said they should not be resuscitated if they fell seriously ill. So staff stopped giving Pat CPR and she died. Our reporter Emma Sweeney has been at the inquest into Pat's death. Emma, this sounds like a nightmare scenario for Pat and her family. Well, perhaps that's putting it uh, rather mildly. Pat Dawson's family today looked visibly upset in court as they told the coroner that their mother had been, in their words, catastrophically failed, not by an individual, but by an entire system. The former NHS nurse was described as the hen of her family. She enjoyed the sunshine, she enjoyed going on holiday, enjoyed watching women. Until this point, she was described as being excellent health but today we heard how it was around five o'clock on the 19th of September last year when she was rushed by paramedics to the Royal Blackburn Hospital with a suspected stomach blockage. Now she'd been there for a few hours when she went to the toilet. She was accompanied by her son John. He was on one side of a cubicle and she was on the other side. Uh, he was regularly asking her if she was okay and for the first couple of uh, times she said she was but on the third occasion there was no response. He asked staff to open up the cubicle. Uh, they went into the cubicle and Mrs Dawson uh, was found slumped over. Now at that point she was given CPR uh, and uh, she, she came around but it was around 15 minutes later when she suffered a second cardiac arrest and crucially this time she wasn't given any CPR and that's because uh, the medical staff found what they thought were her medical records with a do not resuscitate form attached to them. In fact that form was not that of Mrs Dawson's. It belonged to a 90-year-old male patient. Today, the coroner in this case said that it was more likely than not that had Mrs Dawson been given that CPR a second time, that she would have uh, come round and she would have ended up on an intensive care unit. Well, this was the reaction today of Mrs Dawson's family outside court. Not once in the last 30 years had mum personally sought any kind of emergency NHS care. That is, until the tragic circumstances we have relived here today. And tragic is truly what it is. It is beyond belief quite how catastrophically she was failed, not by one individual, but by the NHS Trust. Life will not be the same without mum, and nothing is going to bring her back. But we'd be failing as a family if we didn't highlight how much room for improvement there is at the Royal Blackburn Hospital Emergency Department. Emma, what have the trusts had to say? Well, today in court, the trust offered its sincere condolences to Mrs Dawson's family. There was an acknowledgement that a lack of communication among staff, a lack of uh, awareness uh, and pressures of being in a crowded environment were all factors that were at play. Uh, the court heard how there's been uh, substantial changes since then. And in fact, the coroner said that details of those changes would be circulated to all of the coroners in Lancashire uh, to see whether or not they were uh, uh, reliable and whether or not they'd been 
uh, implemented. Uh, the judge today concluded, or the coroner rather, concluded her remarks in this case by addressing the family, saying, I'm not sure how one gets over an experience like this, but uh, I wish you all the best in trying to do so. OK, Emma Sweeney in Accrington. Thank you. One well, next to the mother who's determined to stop more young drivers being killed on our roads. Yes, Caitlin Huddleston was just 18 when she died. She was a passenger in a friend's car which hit another vehicle on the A5, A595 road near their home in Millham in Cumbria. Her mum, Sharon, in a campaign being launched by road safety charities and the AA, wants the government to bring in what's called graduate driving licences to give drivers greater protection. Our South Lakes reporter, Fiona Marley Patterson, has the story. In 2017, Caitlin Huddleston died in a car crash while a passenger in the car of a newly qualified driver who also died. Their friend and another driver were badly injured. For five years, her mum, Sharon Huddleston, has campaigned for graduated driver licences. Caitlin would be alive if we'd have had certain elements of a graduated driving licence implemented. And that's where young drivers don't carry their teenage friends as passengers for a limited time after passing the test so that they gain experience driving solo or with an older experienced driver with them and we know through research that they're up to four times more likely to crash when carrying passengers because we're hearing it week after week now that carfuls of teenagers are being killed. It would also limit driving at night and require more training before passing your driving test. Now the AA is calling on politicians in an election year to make it law. As well as other things like scrapping smart motorways, it says would make roads safer. We're seeing five people a day killed on the roads. If that was on the railways or the airlines, there'd be a national outcry. There'd be public inquiries. 20% of young drivers crash in their first year and up to 1,500 are killed or seriously injured each year. So what we're saying is for the first six months or so, we should limit the number of passengers young drivers have so that they can gain experience rather than crashing early on and costing lives. The government says the UK has some of the safest roads in the world, but it's working tirelessly to improve road safety. Its Think campaign is targeted at young male drivers and it's commissioned research to help learner and newly qualified drivers improve their skills and safety. But campaigners like Sharon say it's still the leading cause of death for 17 to 24 year olds. It is a lonely place is, is campaigning. So now I've reached out to other families as well and we've set up a group called the Forget Me Not Families United because we do feel forgotten by the government it devastates families. This can't go on any longer. You know, enough is enough. These young deaths on our roads. That is her challenge to politicians. So no other family has to go through the pain hers has. Fiona Molly Patterson, ITV News, Millam. Well, next tonight, and a heartbroken mum has made an emotional appeal for her teenage son to contact her. 15-year-old Ben Smith was last seen in Liverpool city centre in the early hours of Wednesday the 3rd of April. After sending a text to his mum saying, I love you and I'm sorry, his phone has been switched off. Today, Rachel Corkill joined Merseyside Police to plead for any information about Ben's whereabouts. Our reporter Jennifer Buck is in Liverpool now and a horribly worrying time for Ben's family. Absolutely, and the anguish was clear. As Rachel Corkhill, Ben's mum, spoke to us here today, she said she's devastated and she's heartbroken. Now, she spent the last 12 days searching for her son. She's been looking for him. She's been using social media to appeal for any help. She's been trying to contact his friends. Now, she described Ben as a happy teenager. She said that he loves being outside, he loves playing football, he loves going fishing, and he has plenty of friends. But she said the night before Ben went missing, he wasn't quite himself, and he is dealing through a few issues. Now, this is the second time that Ben has gone missing. Last month, he came home safely after a couple of weeks. Now, Ben's mum said, of course, that was distressing, but this is even worse, and she is desperate to know that he is OK. I know he cares, but um, I 
don't know whether he understands like the difficulties like that we're going through now since he is missing. And what's it been like for you the last 10 days or so? Awful, just awful. Can't do anything, can't go anywhere, can't eat, can't sleep, nothing. Rachel Corkhill says she has a good relationship with her son and they could exchange up to 50 text messages a day. She said he was always so good at keeping in touch. But the last text message she received from Ben was on the morning of Wednesday, the 3rd of April. Since then, his phone has been switched off. Now, Mum Rachel was here at Merseyside Police Headquarters today alongside the police officers leading the search for her son. We're exploring all possible lines of inquiry to find Ben and we're acting on any piece of information that we receive from members of the public. Ben, if you're listening or you're seeing this this, uh, appeal, please make contact with us. Please just let us know that you're safe. Contact us and contact your family and let us know where you are. Ben is from the Walton area of Liverpool, but he also has links to Magull and to Cropsteth. And the message from police here tonight is for anybody with any information at all to please get in contact. Jennifer to Merseyside Police HQ, um, thank you. Okay, some more of today's news. And Liverpool has been paying its respects to the 97 football fans unlawfully killed at Hillsborough on the 35th anniversary of the disaster. The bell at Liverpool Town Hall tolled 97 times and there was a minute's silence at exchange flags in the city centre to remember those who died in a crush on the terraces at an FA Cup match on the 15th of April 1989. The silence began at six minutes past three, the time the referee stopped the game. Police have issued images of a man wanted in connection with inquiries after a teenager was raped in Liverpool. Merseyside police were called to St John's Garden where a 16-year-old girl was assaulted. The police are urging the man to come forward and help with the investigation. A man's been given a restraining order after being found guilty of stalking and harassing an MP. Samantha Dixon, the Labour MP for Chester City, was subjected to a series of phone calls, emails and visits to her constituency office by 32-year-old Benjamin Scott Thrale. It started after Mrs Dixon had told him she could no longer help him with a family problem. The Manchester actor Steve Coogan has joined forces with the Save the Windermere campaign to mark their 24th week of action. The strike against sewage protesters are demanding an immediate commitment from United Utilities and the governments to stop all sewage discharge into the lake. And use the money that they're paying out, £12 billion in in, in dividends they've paid over the last uh, 30 years, 12 billion pounds, and they're talking about chucking 40, 70 million at it. It's chicken feed. It has to stop. The public have a right to clean water and to be able to swim in clean water. Fergal Keen last week now, Fergal Sharkey last week, mm-hmm. and now Steve Coogan, now still ahead on ITV News at 6.30 with Lucrezia. Coming up, Israel's allies urge for calm after Iran's unprecedented attack on Saturday. More than 300 missiles and drones were launched at Israeli soil. We'll have the latest as the country considers its next move amid fears of escalation. Also tonight, Trump in the dock. The former president's long-awaited hush money trial gets underway. The first time that a former or current US president has faced a criminal trial. And how one schoolgirl's quick thinking helped save her entire family. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Uh, Council Sport now and Everton's survival fight continues both on and off the pitch. Hello, Mike. Yeah, hi, guys. Yeah, they've had a week to come to terms with their latest punishment, haven't they? Well, today, Everton have launched an appeal against their two-point deduction for breaching the Premier League's financial rules. They can expect a verdict before the season ends on May the 19th. Tonight, they'll use that latest sanction as further motivation to climb out of trouble. This is how the bottom of the Premier League table looks ahead of their match at Chelsea. Everton with plenty to do if they're to avoid relegation this season. Just seven games to go now. I think we've just got to all stay aligned, stay connected and take on the next challenge. And we've had a few knocks. 
you know, this city's had a few knocks in my lifetime, but the club's had a few knocks recently. Let's all pull together and get it done. Manchester United will play Tottenham in the Women's FA Cup final on May the 12th. They booked their place at Wembley by knocking out the reigning cup holders Chelsea in the semis. It ended 2-1 at Lee Sports Village. It was revenge for United, who lost to Chelsea in last year's final. And a special moment for United's head coach Mark Skinner, who has come under fire from some supporters this season. Whether you like me, hate me, I'm still going to be the same person. I'm still going to help. I'm still here to make the team the very best. And in the moment, if I can deliver that for you and you still hate me, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I'm here to produce for you. And that's what I'm here for the fans. I'm here for the club. I'm here to give my... I'm here to sacrifice for that. Well, next to one of the big footballing success stories of the weekend as Stockport County won promotion into League One. They only needed a draw against Morecambe to secure their second promotion in three seasons. In the end, a 2-0 win sparked jubilant scenes at a packed Edgeley Park. Chris Hall was there. In the town famous for its hat museum, they came in their thousands to doff their caps to Stockport County. What emotions are you going through today? Oh, I'm full of emotion today. 61 years I've supported the lads and this is the best they've got. This is going to be a brilliant day for Stockport County. Finally back to League One. We are super excited, aren't we, folks? Came very close to me last time, but I think we're going to, we're going to do it. We're going to work up and then go to the Premier League maybe one day. Excited. Um... A little bit nervous. A bit of trepidation, hoping we can get over the line. You know we're going to get it today, yeah, of definitely. Get it. Trepidation was understandable given the ride they'd been on. They were last in League One in 2010. Just three years later, they dropped into Tier 6 of the English Pyramid, playing teams like Histon and Leamington. Now, just a draw was needed to get them back among ex-Premier League clubs. <laughs> Nice. The boys will probably have an non alcoholic beer tonight because the gaffers banned us. We've said for years this is a championship club minimum. Uh, we've got the infrastructure in place to, to go and do that. You say the manager's banned you from having a few drinks tonight. Yeah, also. Are you going to stick to that? Of course, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting used to promotions here, these fans. Do you think you could go one further in, in the coming years? Yeah, who knows? Uh, you know, the, the chairman backs the club uh, brilliantly, so there's no reason why a big, massive club like this can't go all the way. Will you allow yourself a bit of a celebration tonight? Yeah, I'm Irish, aren't I? So I'll have, a, I'll have a couple. Their incredible 14 year journey from League One down to National League North, back up to League One is finally complete, but their mission for this season is not. Thoughts here are already turning to going up as champions. It's strange because it's tinged with a little bit from, from my perspective of promoted brilliant, but there's that lingering um, thing of the, of, the, of the championship trophy that we, we want to go and make sure we lift. So this is a, a brilliant moment um, and I, got, I suppose at some point this evening I'll enjoy it. Everyone here is delighted, you know, we're all delighted. Our two goals this season was to get promoted and to be champion, so we've done one of our goals, we need to achieve the second one now. A win at Notts County tomorrow would clinch the League Two title and send them up with confidence that the Stockport story of resurgence still has a chapter or two to be written. Chris Hall, ITV News, Stockport. We are going up, we are going up, we are going up. Getting that winning feeling. FOW. Sponsors of the Granada Sport Report. To some of the other sporting headlines from the weekend, starting with a memorable win for Warrington Wolves. They beat rivals St Helens by 31 points to eight away from home to reach the Challenge Cup semi-finals. Winger Matty Ashton with the try of the match. They'll now play Huddersfield in the semis. Cup holders Wigan are also through. They thrashed Castleford Tigers 60 points to six and will take on Hull KR in the final four. In boxing, Warrington's Rhiannon Dixon is the new WBO World Lightweight Champion. She beat Argentina's Karen Carabajal on points at Manchester's AO Arena. On the same card, Manchester's Zelfa Barrett produced the biggest win of his career, stopping Jordan Gill in a world title eliminator.
<laughs> now, a new musical which was developed at Salford's Lowry Theatre has scooped two prestigious Olivier Awards. Yes, our boys go to battle, but we're a different breed for some are born to follow, but we were born to lead. Rousing stuff, Operation Mincemeat, whose cast performed at last night's glitzy ceremony, tells the story of a fantastical secret mission involving a planted dead body and a plan devised by an intelligence officer to confuse the Germans during World War II. Yeah, the hit show was created with the Lowry's development programme and took the best new musical prize and best actor for Jack Malone from Merseyside uh, in a supporting role. Congratulations yeah. for all those involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we've had hailstones and blustery showers. What's next? Here's Joe. Have you burnt tea again? I'm scraping the cold oil into the bin, not the sink. Can we eat outside? It's nice. United mm -hmm. Utility sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thank you. A very good evening to you. I feel like we've had all weathers thrown at us today. Heavy blustery showers, warm spells of sunshine. There's been hail and thunder in the mix. The good news is it is going to settle down as we head through the rest of this week. Bright spells to come tomorrow, less windy by the end of the day and hopefully some drier conditions beginning to move in as this high pressure behind me asserts its dominance across the UK, certainly from Tuesday, Wednesday onwards, pulling in cloud at times as we approach the weekend, but some much needed drier weather ahead. Back to this evening, further heavy downpours for a time, but you'll find after midnight it's generally a good deal drier. Still quite a cold and windy northwesterly tonight. Rurally perhaps three or four Celsius where we see those skies clearing a little for rural Derbyshire, Cheshire and Cumbria tonight. On to tomorrow and for most places a dry start to the day. The sun will be rising at 6.07, setting at quarter past eight tomorrow. Tomorrow, although skies will brighten, there's scope for the odd shower for western fringes. It's a good deal drier in general than it has been today. Still the nagging northwesterly, mind you. But if you're out of the wind and in the sunshine, 13 Celsius is a possibility tomorrow and it shouldn't feel too bad. And skies will clear tomorrow night, allowing temperatures to drop away to around freezing. That's going to give us a chilly start to Wednesday and then cloud begins to feed in across the northwest of England and the Isle of Man over the next few days. So although high pressure is in charge, it's not going to be wall to wall sunshine, I'm afraid, through the rest of the week. Temperatures will be around average. Winds will be a little bit pesky at times, but it should stay dry and fine into this weekend. Enjoy your evening. Bye bye. It's a little bit burnt. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. And finally tonight, congratulations to the running Caterpillar who became a record breaker at the Manchester Marathon. Yes, Team Phil have taken the honour for the fastest marathon run by six people. They completed the race in two hours and 57 minutes in aid of the Motor Neurone Disease Association. They're now planning to join a Roll and Raise event from Bolton to Blackpool with the Corrie actor Natalie Amber in June. I really hope one of those members of the team was called Colin. Terrible jokes from Elaine all week. <laughs> we'll see you later. Good night. <laughs>